Hey, it's Shinobi, and this is episode 2 of Shy 256. So it's August 1st, 2019, two years since the UASF, the New York Agreement, Segwit activating everything culminated and came to a head after almost a year of intense conflict would be a mild way to put it. But the reality is that a lot of people here right now didn't arrive until after all of that was said and done or still have a skewed view of things even if they were here just because of <clears throat> refusing to look at things objectively or frankly buying into the whitewashing uh, of a lot of the actors who supported 2x and signed the new york agreement that they keep up to this day in, in terms of just trying to shift the the perspective and change the context and just completely disconnect what people remember or think happened from what actually happened. And so I thought today I'd give my best shot at trying to put together not something at all super in depth, but just kind of a, a, a chronological rundown of what happened that hopefully for people who just are listening to the wrong people in this space or who weren't here you know, help give you some context to what actually happened. Now, to have proper context for what actually happened with everything surrounding the UASF, you quite literally have to go back all the way to the beginning of Bitcoin. There is a narrative perpetuated by B cashers and a lot of other shit coiners out there that everybody in the early days of Bitcoin was a big blocker and these new people swept in later and hijacked everything and wouldn't raise the block size when everybody wanted to from the beginning. And like, that's just factually incorrect. The, the, the reality is that one of the first replies to Satoshi on the cryptography mailing list when he posted the white paper was by a James Donald within a week running through the, the notion of using Bitcoin to pay for file sharing and realizing that you're going to require multiple transactions a second per person constantly and everything has to be cheap per transaction to do file sharing. And so the only way this can work is have an account money, like build pretty much Bitcoin banks on top of Bitcoin and then use Chalmian uh, blinded tokens on top of that for private spending. Like that was literally within a week, the first reply. Two, two years later, Hal Finney was also talking about Bitcoin banks and Bitcoin just being a settlement layer for other things on top of it. And in his mind at that time, just banks. So. Like, like literally right when Bitcoin was proposed, there were people talking about layers and the inability of this system to scale. And this whole group that, that is trying to gaslight and rewrite history and claim that everybody always wanted big blocks just wouldn't accept any of the arguments that that wouldn't work. And so this kind of rooted itself in there very deeply from the very beginning and kind of was the initial rift forming that would go on to cause a lot of later events. So this rift started getting really bad when you really saw kind of Mike Hearn Gavin Andreessen and Jeff Garzik kind of take uh, a forefront role as far as the public was concerned in development and all three of them 
were pushing for the the just make blocks bigger, everything is fine attitude of things. And the first real attempt at this was Bitcoin XT, which was a fork of Bitcoin uh, Core by Mike Hearn, um, also supported by Gavin Andreessen, that merged a patch to make the block size 8 megabytes and double every six months, I believe, until it hit 32 gigabytes. And this really like it kind of caught on for a bit and got some support and it became a very contentious thing in the different communities on different platforms but ultimately kind of just fizzled out and then immediately afterwards uh, Gavin Andreessen uh, pushed forward Bitcoin Classic as another fork that was supposed to just increase the block size to two megabytes just for now so that we could do this and he had pitched this to a bunch of businesses um because at the time he had been taking on a lot of advisor roles with big companies in the space and a lot of people had also been quietly making trips to china to try to hoodwink miners into going along with this like saying that there are no problems with this like the 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 user base supports this like it, it won't cause issues we should do this and so in response to this a number of bitcoin core developers and uh, a few individuals from blockstream went to Hong Kong and met with a large number of miners and business operators from China. And eventually what came out of this was an agreement to continue forward with development of segregated witness, which had been worked on since the year or two before um, and presented on the year before, uh, deploy that and then have a proposal for a hard fork and a client to release uh, to activate if there was community support a few months after segregated witness. And so th this agreement was produced and everybody walked away. And that was that for the time being. So core devs go back to developing SegWit and get that tested and finalized. And by October 2016, the client with the soft fork to actually activate it by minor signaling is released. So, you know, the first part of, of the Hong Kong agreement, uh, as is portrayed, was fulfilled. And nodes started upgrading very quickly. And it, it got to the point where out of the, the nodes that were visible on the network publicly, uh, which is a small sample of the total, like something like 90% of nodes were upgraded to support segregated witness. But the mining support signaling for it to activate was lagging and it stopped. And it, there, there was a months where it just went on where it, it did never got above like a third at a th or like 30 something percent at the highest and you know at the time nobody knew why like nobody knew why like all of the the drama uh, had produced the hong kong agreement so far everybody was sticking to this and we just didn't get why and during this whole time there was a large amount of what was eventually identified as just intentional spam cycling and just peppering out uh, UTXOs and then recondensing them over and over to drive fees up. And Roger Ver and a large number of the, the big blockers were pushing 
Bitcoin Unlimited now. The idea that everybody, every miner and client will just pick their own block size and everything will just work itself out. And this was something that Bitmain had hinted at support for and some small minority of miners were signaling for and the, the usual crazies were for. But, you know, it, it didn't really make sense why the, the majority of miners weren't signaling for this and what was going on. It, it was a, a very solid upgrade, one with wide support. So what was going on? And like, more importantly, what could users do about it? Sometime in early 2017, I was part of a conversation between four people on the whole situation with SegWit and uh, the stall and minor, and minor signaling and what was going on. And we just started kind of talking about it and, and got to a point that was quasi-philosophical. But the, the, the issue was like we wanted to use SegWit and didn't understand why these people were preventing us from doing so like nobody was going to be forced to use a segwit script when receiving bitcoin no one was going to be forced to store their coins in segwit scripts like and we just started realizing like no one's even going to have to deal with the extra data and validation costs for more transactions if they don't want to, if they don't upgrade. Like even miners don't have to mine SegWit transactions if they don't want to. And we just started like realizing here, like here, this whole situation here, if we could just get it on, is just economic incentives and totally voluntary. Nobody has to deal with SegWit who doesn't want to. But if over time, a lot of people start wanting to, well, it starts changing. You might wanna validate that now. Or if you're a miner who wasn't mining SegWit transactions and they're making up a lot of the volume now, you might want to mine those now because you're losing money not doing that. And just realizing like, you know, th this is stupid. Like if, if we could just like turn it on and just start using it, like the only thing that would have to happen in reality is a miner protect themselves by isolating their node behind a SegWit node. So that's the only node that there's talks to so that it doesn't get a block with invalid SegWit transactions. And then this is totally opt-in in every way. So like it, somebody just needs to just turn it on. On March 12th, 2017, Shaolin Fry published the BIP 148 and proposed a way to turn it on. The BIP specification was essentially just a roundabout flag day that's starting on August 1st, 2017. Any block that is not signaling to activate SegWit is invalid. And the logic was that if everybody upgrades to this, miners will just be mining invalid blocks and eventually have to cave because they aren't making money. And it would not only activate SegWit for BIP148 nodes, but would activate it for all the other nodes that have upgraded to SegWit, but didn't upgrade to BIP148. And so a way to turn it on was out there. Now I, I was kind of skeptical at first personally, but very quickly became a supporter for BIP 148. But this became a very divisive thing amongst a lot of people. There, there was a lot of very rabid support for it, a kind of fuck you attitude. 
to the big mining pools and manufacturers who everybody was looking at and, and just going like, why aren't you just activating SegWit? But there was also a lot of backlash uh, against it and a lot of people who thought that it was a very reckless thing and that if you get a decent amount of people to run BIP-148 and deploy it, but still be a minority like a lot of people could wind up losing money you're causing a chain split if it's really just a minority and a minority of miners go along with it and just causing chaos and everybody thought it just like everybody of that mindset thought that it just wasn't worth it to run this and that it was a very irresponsible and reckless way to try to deal with the, the situation with the, the SegWit deployment and the miners stalling it. In order to deal with a lot of the skepticism and, and backlash uh, against BIP-148, on April 14th, Shaolin Fry proposed BIP-149. And the the gist of this was uh, as opposed to trying to activate existing segwit deployments like bip 148 would uh it would wait until after the current deployments um just regular segwit failed to activate by itself and expired and would deploy this with a new flag day so that pretty much everybody would just upgrade to this and after a certain date segwit is activated and just assume that everybody's upgraded to this and really it, it turned out like a, a lot of people say that all the core devs were against the uasf but in reality almost all of the core devs were for uasf they just would rather um, or, or supported BIP-149 as opposed to BIP-148 because they thought it was safer. Personally, I think this logic is pretty silly because ultimately they both have a chance of a chain split if only a sizable minority upgrades to them. And it's, it's better to just deal with the situation now and just get it over with and all that bip 149 would do in my opinion is really just delay the inevitable risk of a chain split but that would that was put out in april in response to this and, and a lot of people that were initially skeptical of bip 148 looked a lot more favorably on bip 149 and this is something that i think a lot of people newer people might not really understand like the uasf like user activated soft fork is just an abstract idea and bip 148 was ultimately what ended up happening but it it's there there were multiple ways proposed to get segwit activated through a uasf and there are multiple ways to do that in, in regards to upgrades so these two proposals for user activated soft forks to activate SegWit are floating around out there. And there, there's, there's a decent amount of support among very active people in different Bitcoin communities, but overall, it's not a widely sold idea. <clears throat> like the, there is, there's no actual code deployed and it's more just a huge topic of conversation with most people being very skeptical or against the idea and viewing it as incredibly risky. And then in May 2017, during consensus, the huge uh, blockchain conference that happens in New York, uh, Barry Silbert and the Digital Currency Group announce that a significant amount of companies in the ecosystem have got together and compromised with what they call SegWit 2X. And 
that pretty much a client will be coded. And initially they wanted Bitcoin core developers to do this, but that didn't happen. A client that would activate segregated witness in a similar way uh, to BIP 148, except requiring an 80% threshold of miners to signal first, and then activate a two megabyte hard fork after SegWit is activated. Some of the larger companies involved in this were Abra, Bitcoin.com, uh, Bitfury, Bitmain, Bitflyer, Blockchain.info, uh, Jeff Garzik's Block, Circle, Coinbase, F2 Pool, Gavin Andreessen, Open Bazaar, Shapeshift, Via BTC, and Zappo. So this completely changed everything for multiple reasons. One, in combination with SegWit, uh, a doubling on top of that would put the, the validation cost and the, the relay cost uh, of running Bitcoin and throwing blocks around and validating them to a very high point uh, that could start pushing a lot of people or entities off the network. And second that it was essentially just this coalition of large companies in the space saying we dictate the rules and that is just completely antithetical to how a market system actually works every entity above the consumer is beholden to the consumer collectively and so the consumers responded. Luke Jr. in particular uh, was a big vocal figure in advocating for BIP 148 and code was written um, with the BIP 148 patch and deployed. People started running it. And things really became a game of chicken between supporters of the UASF and these larger corporations trying to push the New York agreement and SegWit 2X down everybody's throat. And like that, that got to a really potentially dangerous point if you're looking at the, the fallout and damage it could cause because we were dug in. Like, and, I, and by we, I mean people running BIP 148. Like our rationale was that the nature of this, this fork was completely asymmetrical in that the BIP 148 chain, if things split, if these companies stuck with this, would continue to exist even if it had less work than the other chain. But if the BIP 148 chain acquired more work and outpaced the other chain, it would reorg the other chain out of existence. Because the entire invalidating blocks not signaling for SegWit is asymmetrical. And so we could exist for a while as a separate chain and eventually if the market swung over and miners had no choice but to come over to continue making money, BIP 148 could go a long time as a minority chain and wipe the other one out of existence if it came out on top. And we were willing to actually take it to that point. Like that's as far as we were willing to go. Because in, in my mind, personally speaking for myself, if, if this group of a, a handful of corporations can just step in and dictate the rules of Bitcoin, can change it, to raise the costs of participating directly so far that most people can't participate and it's now just this group deciding what the rules are then that's not bitcoin and bitcoin failed okay so so far i've been recounting things chronologically but i'm going to break from that here for a little bit 
to go into some of the participants in the NYA and their motivations and some things we've learned about that and events after the fact that paints somewhat of a clearer picture of some of the things I've already gone over and some things I'll go into after. So first I want to talk about Bitmain and most importantly uh, what we learned after the fact regarding ASIC boost explains a lot. So during the whole period of SegWit being stalled, uh, the network constantly being spammed with a big mempool backlog, Bitmain's ant pool and other pools affiliated with Bitmain were mining empty or nearly empty blocks. And the explanation turned out to be their use of ASIC boost, which the commitments to signature data in the Coinbase transaction interferes with. So they had a direct economic incentive to stop SegWit from activating because it loses them money when their optimization doesn't work anymore. Another interesting thing is we found out after the fact that Jihan was actually coercing other miners in the ecosystem by threatening um, cutting them off from future equipment sales if they were to signal to activate SegWit, which ties back into the entire economic incentive related to ASIC boost. And then lastly, um, that extended also into the Litecoin community, that behavior when they went to activate SegWit. And there's actually a leaked chat log from a miners group where Jihan and others are openly discussing that if SegWit is allowed to activate on Litecoin, it would undermine all of the nonsense reasons they'd been creating to justify not activating SegWit on Bitcoin when the real reason boiled down to ASIC boost. So this... This showed that Bitmain was just leveraging their centralized position in ASIC manufacturing to try and manipulate Bitcoin development to benefit them over others. Next up, we have Jeff Garzik from Block, who was the lead maintainer of BTC1, the Segwit2x reference client. Uh, where to start? Uh, the entire process was him just dictating things and merging code with no discussion or review. Uh, he often implemented things in, in a very poor way when he did so. Uh, he initially refused to implement replay protection. And then when he finally relented and did, did so in a very hack around, inefficient, confusing way. And just banned anybody from any discussion group set up for Segwit2x development that questioned following the agenda blindly in the slightest. And it was absurd. And during the same period, Block was also uh, involved in a number of Ethereum ICO projects um, that he also personally advised for, one of which he was involved in developing. Met or metronome that was actually billing itself as a currency that could survive blockchains failing. It was an Ethereum token that could migrate to other Ethereum-like blockchains. But he, as we all know, wound up creating the off by one error bug, where if things had followed through, as all these guys hoped, would have stalled the entire Bitcoin network at the block before the 2x hard fork and left it stalled there. So round of applause for Jeff. This is who was in charge of the software development and technicals of the New York agreement. After Jeff, we have Coinbase which nowadays is, is evident is just a sinking ship ran by incompetent baby Brian Armstrong, um, as everybody seems to be leaving there. But uh, two months after the UASF resolved itself, we found out that Coinbase was sitting on 
millions and millions of dollars of fragmented dust outputs of like just cents or a couple of dollars a piece. And at the time, with the high fee market and high fee rate, it would have cost more than all of that money was worth to spend it because it was so fragmented across individual UTXOs. And uh, Coinbase has always had a stupid streak when it comes to technology in this space and has supported every attempt to raise the block size that has happened so far. But this utxo incident which we don't really know how bad it is like we only saw a, a cluster of utxos in one incident publicly it was a direct monetary incentive to do anything to push the block size up and prevent fee pressure so that they could deal with this issue that ultimately was the result of just completely incompetent business management Next, we have BitPay and Stephen Pear, who are a payment processor for on-chain Bitcoin transactions. Now, in March 2017, uh, Stephen Pear wrote a Medium post addressing the rising fee rates and how that was affecting their business processing transactions and admitted it was causing trouble. But the entire post was, was written in the tone of this is Bitcoin and the market is going to sort things out and was speaking very positively about second layer solutions. Like, I mean, obviously it's something that affects their business model, but like he's looking at the long term when you read this post, it seems. And then two months later, Shortly before the New York agreement, they sign a multi-million deal or multi-million dollar deal with Bitmain to develop software for managing mining equipment and BitPay becomes a big supporter of the New York agreement, Segwit2x, uh, moves on to eventually continue pushing that route through Bcash and completely stalling all development or integration or testing with second layer technologies. But, you know, ultimately their lack of progress in that department and how a fee market developing affects their business otherwise is a big motive to just push for 2x because it's in line with your business model who cares what, what the consequences are for other entities on the network. Okay, so this one I think is really insidious. Andreas Schildbach, the developer maintaining Bitcoin J, the Java library for Bitcoin that most mobile wallets are built with, um, without telling anybody, quietly included BTC1, the Segwit2x client, um, nodes in the dns node list for bitcoin j and so a dns node is pretty much how a wallet or a node finds other nodes on the network at first to plug into the peer-to-peer -peer network and it'll work on a domain name that somebody hooks a node up to and because light clients don't fully validate rules this was part of the whole strategy of 2x is to get the miners to follow through with this the 2x chain would be longer and then all of these white clients that might have got caught up using this in this library would just blindly follow the 2x chain and just unwillingly get dragged along whether they wanted to or not and this was a central aspect of the whole 2x strategy to try and succeed is to take advantage of all of the users who are not fully validating things themselves when they interact with Bitcoin. Okay, these last three are going to be kind of quick. So first off, Roger Ver, I mean, at this point in time, unless you are very new in this space, it should be obvious he is just a fanatical lunatic who refuses to accept technical reality because it conflicts with 
some lunatic dogma he got stuck in his head. Um, yeah, his involvement with the New York agreement shouldn't need much explanation. Uh, Wang Chun was a treat. The operator of F2 Pool through the entire thing. Um, he, he was a signatory of the NYA. But then during the entire event, he would do things like take a, a group photo with a UASF hat on. Or take a picture of his server with a UASF hat next to it. Or one of my favorites was uh, take a picture of an elevator in a tower in Dubai or somewhere on floor 148. And his pool for a while would do just absurd things like signal for segwit, not signal for segwit, like flip back, just like like the the signaling for different upgrades would just flicker like a pretty Christmas tree because he was screwing around. And at the end of all the things, he ended up backing out of the hard fork part after and pointed to a table that was compiled of support for different things from individuals and companies where he had put acceptable until July for Segwit 2X. And after Segwit activated successfully and July had ended, said, well, it's after July, so 2X isn't acceptable anymore. And yeah, that, that was a treat. And then Wences uh, Cesares, the CEO of Zappo, a, uh, a storage and a debit card platform for Bitcoin, is the one of the only people involved in this all who's kind of publicly, openly just said he was wrong and supporting the New York agreement and 2X was a mistake. And kind of undermined everything that made Bitcoin valuable. And he, he's like one of the only people involved on that side who's done this uh, to the present day. To get back to a little bit of chronological ordering, um, around the time that the New York Agreement and Segwit2x was announced, James Hilliard, um, who worked for a Bitmain subsidiary, proposed BIP91 which was effectively um, a new miner signaling separate from SegWit activation that miners could signal for with an 80% lock-in uh, to successfully trigger, upon which point everybody running BIP91 would orphan anything not signaling uh, for SegWit activation and the start of this was to be june 1st so the the rationale was pretty much set up a new mining trigger that would trigger the same thing as bip 148 and activate segwit well around late june through july this idea started gaining more traction and eventually this is what was implemented. And personally, I want to note here that a large number of miners, uh, I would speculate beyond the ones I know, but were running just the BIP91 patch and not the official 2x client BTC1. But this ended up activating and locking in in late July. Uh, BIP 148 activated and a chain split did not occur with SegWit activating and going live one difficulty period later. So this for the most part left the UASF a success in the most optimi er, optimistic case. Miners caved, activated SegWit and that was locked in. But there was still the looming 2x hard fork aspect of things in early November. So some exchanges, uh, Bitfinex notably, launched futures for Segwit 2x tokens. And it, it was not a massive amount of volume, 
but it, it was all pricing it very low compared to the the high value bitcoin had grown to after segwit locked in and had activated and you know like i said earlier uh, talking about wang chung he pulled out of the hard fork aspect of it later and things pretty much just started unraveling from this point until literally right before the hard fork was going to happen uh the miners backed out of it and uh, the CEOs of, of the big companies fronting everything just called it off at the last second and, and the fork never actually happened. And most of the miners never actually even updated to run the Segwit2x client BTC1, which if they had, would have frozen the network a block before the hard fork because of a bug Jeff Garzik introduced. So, like, ultimately, after all of this, like, the, the UIS app, like, it, it worked out optimistically. Like, the miners caved and activated SegWit, and a chain split never occurred. And everybody backed down at the last minute from the hard fork afterwards. And we also found out that most of the miners never even upgraded or ran software that would have initiated the hard fork. Now, in the end, like, the UASF and like the surrounding events and just the context of it in the larger history of Bitcoin is just so important to understand. Like money is a completely intersubjective thing. Like it's only useful and valuable because we all agree it is. But the way Bitcoin works, like miners finalize transactions in batches and one bad transaction or invalid one in a batch ruins the whole batch and in order to validate a single transaction you have to validate the whole batch so like it's, it's really important that everybody involved in bitcoin can actually do that when they're interacting with the, with Bitcoin, when they're receiving Bitcoin through the network, or they can't decide for themselves what intersubjective thing they're going to value. And the whole incident with the NYA was all of these major corporations, like a lot of which I've spelled out had direct monetary incentives in conflict with people being able to validate things, to participate like that, tried to just shove this change down our throat that would damage people's ability to do that and just set the precedent that a group of corporations like this can just change things fundamentally like this. And the whole value of Bitcoin is a money that can't be controlled or censored or seized. That that's beyond points of control that can be manipulated. And the NYA, the, this stalling of, of SegWit because of Bitmain's incentive conflicts, like these were all completely at odds with Bitcoin's entire value foundation. Like being that censorship resistant thing beyond control. And the fact that the the UASF like BIP one forty eight the the users the the consumers in this market ultimately asserted that control and that influence and that sovereignty and won showed that Bitcoin could withstand that that type of attack is a timeless lesson because this is this was the first time Bitcoin was ever attacked on a large scale like that. And it's not going to be the last time it happens. So like these lessons, understanding these events in this space is unbelievably important.